On behalf of Equestrian Canada, we'd like to welcome you to this, this evening's webinar. We hope you find this webinar both informative and entertaining. For those who are not familiar with Zoom features, we ask you to mute your line and to avoid any background interference during the presentation. We hope you, we wish to submit, if you wish to submit a, a question during the session, please use the Q&A feature, which you should find at the bottom of your screen on the toolbar. We ask you not to avoid using the chat function as we find it disturbing to the presenter. As we have a number of people joining tonight's call, we ask you to be patient if we have experienced any technical difficulties during this session. One, we will do, open up the floor for questions between after the human impairments um, section. We'll open the floor for questions and then we'll do Q&A at the end again for after equine paces. So without further delay, I introduce you the presenter for this evening. He is the technical advisor for the para dressage high performance program, the Questioning Canada. He brings over 25 years experience to the sport to Canada, including leading athletes to multiple medals at the World of Question Games and the Paralympics. I welcome Clive Milkins. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to speak on this pretty important topic. Um, it's about 11 o'clock in the evening, UK time, and if I get distracted, I've got a crazy six-month-old puppy who at the moment has not decided to settle. So. Um, he promises me he will go to bed, but if things go into chaos, he is the reason why. I think the purpose of tonight's presentation and the notes I'm going to deliver are really to provide a basic information on some of the conditions that uh, experienced para coaches regularly come across when working in the industry. These notes are not, I repeat, not designed to be a medical textbook. For a start, I'm not medically qualified. Um, at the same time, any medical information that I deliver tonight has been checked and verified by several international, uh, both classifiers, doctors and physiotherapists. So the, the technical knowledge is correct, but this is not a medical lecture. Also tonight, I've deliberately kept away from the classification and discussion about sport. Um, this is specifically about human impairments and how they're, they affect people on, on a horse. Classification and adapted equipment is covered in uh, other presentations we've been delivering. And so the whole thing is, has to be put together as a, as a working package. Also, these notes are, are notes that I've compiled over 25 to 30 years uh, of working within the industry, and they're for practical use within the riding environment. They're meant to be a little bit of an aid memoir, if you like. I think before any coach embarks on a coaching journey with a disabled rider, it, it is advised that a medical professional, doctor, physiotherapist, checks and agrees that riding as a sport rather than as a therapy is a safe hobby or sport for everyone to pursue. Please also remember that as a coach we have a duty of care to respect the dignity and humanity of each and every one of our clients. So the first thing I always think about is the careful consideration of the use of language must be employed. Let's face it, if you have lost your leg in an accident, it can be pretty insulting to ask a rider to put their leg on. Maybe also something like, look where you're going, is insulting when aimed at a rider with a visual impairment. Please also remember that this, as I say, this presentation is to be listened to in conjunction with the presentation on adaptive equipment and classification. The two are linked very closely. So coaching an athlete with a disability is a fascinating challenge and I guarantee that any coach who goes down this path will end up learning a lot more about themselves as a consequence. It's always about what the rider can do and can perform we should be looking at. Coaching should be about achievements and what can be done 
not what can't. And what can't be done, there's, there's a way around it. Reminding athletes and their families of yet another activity that can't be completed is not confidence building. And where there's a challenge, finding a logical, safe solution is the way forwards. It's about honest education. The patience to, to work through the challenges and, and the inquiring mind to solve puzzles. I also believe that any coach, in order to help the athlete properly, does need to have a basic knowledge of how the impairment can present itself in the riding arena. Of course, the impairment is not the whole athlete. And we must remember that we are coaching somebody who has an added challenge to their riding skills. These challenges, though, do not define the person. They just add an extra dimension. So, of course, the most logical thing to do when embarking on a journey of coaching a para rider is to ask the rider themselves, explore with them what they physically can do, as well as their understanding of what is required in order to ride a horse effectively through a dressage test. Ask their personal assistants and their parents and anyone that knows the ride, rider and observe for yourself. For often athletes are so in tune with their own body that they sometimes forget that in a new and an alien environment, their own body can behave differently under pressure. And it's a good riding position is always a good therapy position and vice versa. Riders often improve and develop better skills on a horse before they've even realized it. So sometimes when they say, we can't do this or this doesn't function properly. Actually, you're seeing something different because their body is already adapting to their environment. Athletes also have their own expectations and their own concerns. These external challenges must be addressed carefully. As I've said in other presentations, watch how the athlete walks, observe their own range of movement in all their limbs away from the horse. This will help understand what is possible. Next slide, please. One of the questions I've never worked out is, if, and if anyone's got any ideas, I'd be more than happy to start a correspondence about it. How do we define the difference between disability and a lack of ability? How do we define the difference between disability and lack of ability? In fact, if the rider doesn't trot, is that because they can't? Is that due to the available horsepower, the lack of experience? strength, knowledge, or is it the fact the disability prevents them from carrying out a task? These are questions that we have to reflect upon privately, fairly, calmly, and logically in order to help each individual athlete. At the same time, we should always ask the question, just because a rider can ride a pace or a movement, does it mean they should? After all, welfare is the most paramount importance. No one has an inbuilt right to trot or canter. That privilege must be earned. In the same way, not every runner is going to compete at international level, and not every able-bodied rider is going to make Grand Prix. Not every athlete with an impairment is going to get to the Paralympics. Para means parallel. And the quality and knowledge of the dressage must be maintained at all times. The degree of difficulty varies, but correct dressage is always paramount. Next slide, please. So this well, particular just slide. Just a moment. Whoops, sorry, Clive. We're just having a few problems with our slides. So okay. just like, what slide would you like? I've Lee, just had yes. to go to the, uh, the Lee, rock. This slide, this slide is perfect. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. That's okay. Here you see a rock suspended in midair. Or do you? Next slide, please. Now we see the real picture, a rock in a lake. Same picture, upside down. For it's all about the observation skills. And when we're coaching a rider, we all strive to focus on those riding goals of each rider. We focus, if you like, on the rock. 
But in order to challenge and train each person, a knowledge of the challenges each client faces enables us to have a greater understanding of the individual. This, this knowledge helps with the communication, the safety, the dignity, and the longevity of each person and their riding career. Observation is always the key. Secondary factors, fatigue, irritability, muscle damage, skin breakdown, are physical signs of overexertion. We must remember that the regulation of temperature within the individual can be different with a rider with an impairment. We're all different. And just because as a coach, we may have stamina and can tolerate heat or cold, doesn't mean that everyone else does. We aim to challenge and educate our riders in a productive way. A knowledge of the disability ensures that we do not accidentally push a rider in a way that is unsafe. Saying the wrong thing through a lack of knowledge can demoralize a rider, can hurt feelings. And once the feelings of a rider are hurt, it's difficult for them to come back from that. Remember that when we're watching a rider on a horse, just because we can see a particular physical movement occurring, it doesn't mean to say that the rider has conscious control over that movement or the movement may be completely involuntary. The rider may also be creating and stimulating that movement. When we're helping a rider with, an, uh, with a disability, with an acquired disability, we ensure that the athlete have time to rebuild themselves and to redefine their reality. Mental preparation should be introduced at an early stage of athlete development. Identify the added challenges. Cognitive and emotional may influence their readiness to be a contender on the competition circuit. Next slide, please. Athletes with an acquired neurological impairment can often have an existing athletic background or equine knowledge that then can transfer into para sport. This has got to be thought about on a case by case scenario, depending on the extent of the disability, background, education and prior knowledge. The warning here, of course, is that there can be an added challenge of riders getting frustrated because they cannot do what they once did. And not every athlete who was able bodied wants to go back to riding. And sometimes if they want to go back to riding, they don't want to go back to what they did before. They want to do something new and exciting, develop a new skill. When we're looking at the athlete with an impairment, consideration needs to be given to the presence of certain medical equipment that each rider may use and need. External supports may be worn to support and control joint positioning. This equipment may or may not be appropriate when riding. In each case, it is advisable to seek the knowledge of a medical professional in order that safe practices and comfort for both horse and rider may be achieved. Welfare of the horse can never be compromised. Additional challenges to our horses can include the weight of the athlete. That's not necessarily that the rider is on the larger side, it can be simply that they carry their weight heavier on one side to the other. And a rider with poor core stability will sit crooked and put extra pressure on one side of the horse or the other. Prosthetic lower limbs or flail limbs and even just tight limbs can cause rubs to the horse's skin. Support splints can pinch. Some horses will not accept the athlete who rides one-handed. Some, some horses will not cope with a flail or swinging lower limb or even upper limb. Athletes with impaired feeling and sensitivity may sadly balance on their hands. Riders who cannot shift their weight end up putting extra pressure on specific areas on the horse's back when standing still. And in the winter in the UK, horses are often clipped in order to maintain easier welfare and cleaning. However, these horses can then get cold. Their backs get cold when they're stood still for long periods of time, such as the mounting block, or when technical discussions are being taken place. The, muscle, the muscles of the horse can then tighten, creating soreness and stiffness. And if the rider is sat in one position for a, a period of time, that can cause uh, pressure sores to the rider, 
and rubbing to the horse. With each medical condition, it is advisable to be aware whether it can change, sometimes for the better, or is it as a deteriorating condition? Especially in the progressive disabilities where riders' abilities can, will deteriorate through muscle wasting, increasing joint stiffness, nerve deterioration. All of this can produce frustration and early fatigue. Some conditions, on the other hand, remain static and are unlikely to change. Have to remember that if an athlete has got a deteriorating condition, they will soon become frustrated, especially in a group situation, that they, they see themselves not as able as they once were. That can be demoralizing and hurtful, and we have to bear that in mind as a coach. And then we have to deal with language. Coaches the whole time, and physios the whole time, talk about muscle tone. Coaches need to be aware of muscle tightness or normal tone or floppy tone when riders, parents and medical practitioners refer to a rider, the rider's disability. Increased tension in the muscle tone is also known as spasticity, tense muscles or even hypotonia. Coaches must be aware of using words such as relax, soften, when helping these riders. The tension in these muscles is not voluntary. The rider often needs time in the sat saddle to allow the muscles to tire and settle down and function more correctly. Decreased muscle tone is often referred to as floppy or hypotonic. We talk about spasms. A muscle spasm is again involuntary. It's a contraction of the muscle that can cause a great deal of pain and a loss of controlled, relaxed movement. It can be triggered by sudden loud noises, sudden movements. You can actually cause a young person to fall off if you raise your voice and make them jump and their body twitches and goes into spasm. We have to remember this. We also have to remember that the horse has to be able to cope with the spasm and realize it doesn't mean it was an aid. A good coach often is used to reading their horses very well. So a good coach will always have good observation skills when it comes to their horses. So it's important to notice the change in muscle tone as the athlete relaxes and warms up, which is a good thing. But also stop the session before the tone tightens again through fatigue. Read the, read the facial expressions of the rider. Notice if communication levels and type of communication changes. Sometimes riders will need to get on and just slowly move for a few minutes without their stirrup so their legs relax and start working with the horses. Don't try and start coaching straight away. It very often doesn't work. And for the sake of this presentation, I'm focusing mainly on physical challenges. Of course, I'm very well aware that many of the riders we work with have cognitive challenges as well. At the present time, para-sport is designed primarily for those with physical challenges. And the conditions can be split into several groups. When working with a rider with a disability, it must be remembered that each person and their condition is individual. Each named condition will affect the individual differently and although the condition may have a name, the, the, the symptoms can be complex and manifest themselves in unique ways. So in order to preserve dignity to the individual, honest professional communication is the best way to learn from a client. And that means sometimes not in the arena, away from other people listening, dignified, quiet, and learning. As a coach, the highest levels of standards must be applied and all the conversations should be treated in the strictest confidence. I was in a taxi recently in London when a taxi driver said to me, does your person knows where she wants to go? My person replied for herself saying, yes, thank you. I do know where I want to go. And I have a master's, in master's degree in mathematics as well. The taxi driver had seen the disability and assumed rather than seeing the person. 
It's strongly advised that the support and knowledge of a qualified medical professional is sought at the beginning and at regular intervals during a training programme in order to monitor physical improvements. In my experience, physios are more than happy to help advise with the coaching. And please note that the, the photographs in these in this presentation are from my own personal collection wherever possible and I have permission to use them. I've avoided wherever possible using present Canadian athletes to prefer, preserve confidentiality and discretion. The major group of riders that we deal with in para sport have neurological conditions and these neurological conditions are cerebral palsy, spina bifida, spinal cord injuries, head injuries, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, strokes, polio, which is rare these days. And then we go on to the sensory disorders of visual impairments, hearing impairments, and tactile problems. So this video is of a visual athlete with a visual impairment. She is a grade four rider. And you can see that her partner is actually in the arena calling the letters. Visual impairments may be present from birth or caused by injury or as a result of another disability. And of course, may be partial or complete. Visual impairment is a real challenging disability to understand as a coach because a rider can only explain or show their own perception of sight. It can be tricky to relate to the challenges that each rider as an individual has. A coach must never assume that a visual impairment is easy to interpret and understand. We all see and interpret what we see differently. Sy um, symptoms include only distinguishing light and dark, blurring of vision, loss of vision is only one eye, loss, loss of peripheral vision, and which is tunnel vision where only the object straight ahead is seen. Any damage to a rider's sight or the communication between the eyes and brain or a loss of vision in one side of the visual field causes confusion to the rider. Every time, extra time for the rider to compute instructions and translate it into action must be factored into the training. Consideration must be given to ensure effective communication to the health and safety of all participants. Hearing is of vital importance to the VI rider, as you can see here, whereas um, the person in the middle is only calling the letters and nothing else. Too much distracting noise from the outside the arena is not helpful. Parents talking on the gallery. Commands must be specific and clear and calling a test with living commanders must be practiced and the rider, the rider's needs must be listened to. Markers, uh, markers should be large and the rider may not be able to see the letter but the marker will act as a reference point. And very often, as long as they turn the right way at C, they know where they are in the arena. Um, some athletes use counting to work out where they are in the arena. That takes practice. If you're going to use um, markers, yellow is the best color, as it's the last color to be lost from sight. Also, all markers should be three dimensional. It can be very tricky using markers when the walls of the indoor school are the arena edges. And if you just pin up a letter, like most of us do, it's difficult to see the edge of that. For riders with, with poor sight, it may help to have the mane braided with white tape so the rider can see where the horse's neck is in front of them. A large white sheepskin on the headpiece or ear plugs on the horse can highlight where the head is. Balance in the visually impaired athlete is often compromised and many of them do not like being lunged. The VI rider may often tip their head to one side in order to adjust their sight. And learning must be done one step at a time, position and core stability being established, then feeling and following the movement and the paces of the horse, then the accuracy, and then the horse's way of going. And every educational piece should be confirmed before moving on. Circles, center lines and corners are a challenge to teach and take time. Any movement that does not have walls, and let's face it, most dressage tests have most movements without walls near them. They are island movements, so they give no support to the learning rider. 
Having a horse that is used to dressage boards helps as they must know not to step out over them. I do believe horses for visually impaired riders shouldn't be allowed to do trotting poles. Jumping, yes. Trotting poles, no. The horses learn to step over them. And I also like to use only the size arena where the, uh, the correct size dressage arena. It's also a challenge where the whiteboards are on the ground rather than raised quite high. The horse must learn to turn at each corner. Years ago, we used to use high fences. The rules were that the fences had to be a, at least a meter high until we suddenly worked out after several accidents that horses cantering down the long side, if the athlete didn't turn, they were likely to jump out over the edge of the arena. Now we stick small boards like everybody else. Deafness is an unseen and major disability and can, again can be present from birth or acquired later in life. Balance is often affected and speech may also be affected. The major challenge is always communication. With, with deaf riders, the best way to learn is off the horse by reading and studying videotapes. Riders often communicate through lip reading or sign language. Eye contact is very important when coaching a, a hearing impaired athlete. Stopping, explaining, and then practicing are the way to achieve success. And of course, these days, video analysis help no end. Care must also be taken um, when the, with the fitting of hats around hearing aids. Next slide, please. Next slide from, okay. So the second group of disorders are musculoskeletal disorders. Any condition affecting bones, muscles, joints, and so include arthritis, limb deformity, and absence. And then as, as well after that, we also then look at some of the mind, some of the learning challenges we also have with our disabilities. Next slide, please. One of the most widespread of disabilities that we deal with are athletes with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy just described a group of permanent neurological disorders that resulted from, from, a, from damage or a lesion of the brain before, during or after birth. These disorders in their widest sense can cause activity limitations. Uh, limitations. They are attributed to a non-progressive damage in the brain, but occurs in the developing fetal or infant brain. These motor disorders are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, and communication. And due to the variable nature of the condition, there can be secondary problems relating to vision, hearing, speech, and also learning ability. Each client has got to be treated as an individual, and may have poor speech, but an excellent understanding. Children sometimes have epileptic seizures. One of the challenges with cerebral palsy is that when somebody is having a specific test for say sight or hearing, when the, the, the person is concentrating under medical conditions, they'll very often discover there is no visual or hearing impairment. However, when a rider is multitasking in the competition field, their concentration span and the control they have means that their abilities can be narrowed from time to time. The challenge with cerebral palsy are that not all limbs are necessarily affected and there can be a, there can be a general problem with balance and muscle control. And the effects of cerebral palsy can be seen in just one hand, just one limb, just one side, or just one half of the, the whole body. Here's an interesting trivia fact for you. The word quadriplegic is Latin. And tetraplegic is from the word, is from the Greek. Both mean four limbs. So as far as medical uh, jargon is concerned, the convention seems to be that quadriplegia is used for cere uh, cerebral palsy and tetraplegia is used for spinal injuries. Next slide, please. Usually we find that cerebral palsy can be grouped like this, where quadriplegia is all 
limbs and the trunk are affected, hemiplegia, where one side of the body is affected, tetraplegia, where three limbs are affected, and diplegia, where the trunk and either the arms or legs can be affected. Usually with diplegia, it's more the legs and there's an awful lot of tightness in the adductor muscles or the inner thighs. And you can have monoplegia where only one limb is affected. Next slide, please. Here we have um, a, a British rider who has the condition of quadriplegic cerebral palsy. It actually makes her pretty, uh, pretty symmetric, but everything is affected, even though the horse is going so nicely for her. Next slide, please. This young man is hemiplegic. You can see from this picture that the right hand side the arm is, is not in contact with the reins, it's very tight and he suffers from dystonia. So the arm tends to prefer to be sat away from the horse in its own position. With athletes like this, if you try and make the arm go into the correct position or strap the arm down, the body can very often re react violently in the wrong, the wrong way. Next slide, please. And then this young man has diplegia. So from, the, from his waist upwards, his body functions in a pretty acceptable way, but he is very tight from the waist downwards. Classification of the visual symptoms are as follows. We've talked about, we mentioned spasticity before. Can be described as an imbalance in the inhibitory and exci uh, excitation nerve signal sent to the muscles we get unintentional strong muscle contraction and an, and an inability to willfully make the muscles relax. This increase in muscle tone due to loss of control of the spinal cord reflexes causes tightening and the body doesn't like sitting in one position. You'll find that movement is difficult, stiff, awkward and probably limited. When the legs are affected, the, tight, the adductor muscles are often very tight, so it's difficult to stretch and separate the hips. Usually a narrow horse is required and stretching exercises before the riding may well be useful. Often the rider needs to be a, a, needs to be a little bit tired before the lower limbs hang loosely enough to be affected. There's no medical scientific proof for this, but I've discovered that actually if the athletes with cerebral palsy ride for a little bit, then they get tired. The cerebral palsy part of the brain, the affected part of the brain gets tired first and gives up, allowing the other parts of the brain to function more normally for up to 10, 15, maybe even 20 minutes before complete fatigue sets in and the rider becomes too fatigued to continue. If you're competing, you're looking for that window once the, the CP part of the brain has given up and sits quietly for a bit, allowing the other parts of the body to take over. Often in the lower limbs, the hips and knees may be permanently fixed in position. The arms may be held tightly against the body with the elbows bent and the fist is very often clenched tightly. We've talked about muscle tone before, but it's an expression used by therapists and other, med other medical professionals. And it's the resting state of the muscle. It's when it's in theory, it's a bad word, but it's when, when it's relaxed. Muscle tone very often increases with fear, stress, concentration, sudden movements, loud noises, and the cold. But this tension and muscle tightness will often decrease during smooth, repetitive exercises when the patterns of the body know what's coming next. The walking movement of the horse is via a good walking horse is vital to get that repetitive muscle memory so the body relaxes. Athletes with low tone, that's the opposite, have to put up with a lot more effort into channeling and controlling their muscular movements. This takes a lot of energy. Fatigue happens very quickly. Often our athletes suffer from ataxia. 
A taxi air affects balance and, and depth perception when, that, when you're riding. That's very important when it comes to spatial awareness in a dressage test. Poor coordination of the limbs and muscle control are also challenges. Balance, coordination are affected. And so people with ataxia often learn to stand and walk with their ankles wider apart than their hips with a base wide movement. Also that lack of depth perception means there's a lack of fine motor skills. Dystonia is always challenging because it is fluctuating muscle tone. It changes from day to day. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Uh, anybody looking at this will notice that the E in the mirror is backwards. That's because I was stood at E and it's in the mirror. Again, it's observation. So this young lady has um, a lot of ataxia. So we find riding her without stirrups works really well. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm pretty anti-stirrups at the best of times. I find riders can fall cleaner and easier without stirrups. And especially in these COVID related times, you spend less time close to the athlete adjusting stirrups. It's made a lot of difference to the athletes that can ride in some of the therapeutic centers in the UK. We also are looking at, like with this young lady, this, uh, this young lady has athetosis, which is um, a disconnected motor patterns. So the involuntary movement with her is a lack of control. So you'll see writhing, waving movements the whole time. It finds all muscle groups and interferes with normal muscle function and balance. Sometimes breathing is affected because let's face it, the lungs are a muscle. Speech and spatial, spa facial expression can also be affected by this. And of course, then you will get some athletes that have a mixed type of cerebral palsy where sometimes they don't respond to one particular type of CP. Some muscles will be tight and others will be too, la too re relaxed. And the symptoms therefore can vary uh, considerably. Not all limbs are affected and there's a general problem with balance and muscle control. But from a therapeutic point of view, riding helps develop the automatic responses to movement and normalizes and stabilizes muscle tone. When a rider is a placed a strider horse, that horse can provide a base of support and support the balance, both static and dynamic. And once this foundation is created, the rider can work on controlling their own movements and balance through rhythmical and balanced movements. This can help normalize tone and allow increased functionality. Next slide, please. <coughs> One of the conditions we see very rarely now, but we do still come across is spina bifida. And spina bifida is a neurological disorder that occurs in the vertebral spine failing to fuse before birth. The, this results in damage to the spinal cord. The lesion or the damage can occur anywhere in the spine, but most often occurs in the lower back. Because this lesion site varies, the symptoms and severity of, of the condition also varies. You'll very often find that an athlete with um, a lesion will, will have a lordotic lower spine, i.e. their lower spine curves in towards their, their rib cage. There is always a loss of skin sensation below the level of the lesion. So the coach must ensure that the adult athlete checks their own skin doesn't break down. And in the younger athlete, the parents check for themselves. For poor circulation means that pressure or friction sores take a long time to heal. And the rider does not feel this friction burn until it is too late. These sores can very often occur in the lower leg care must be taken in stirrup length and fitting. A saddle, um, a seat saver may protect the rider's seat, but if skin breakdown occurs, riding must be stopped until the wound recovers. Spinal deformity often means the balance is impaired and the symmetry is compromised. 
Most athletes will use a wheelchair for long distances. Some though will be weight bearing and can walk. Muscle paralysis below the lesion causes floppy muscle tone and a poor walking gait. And because of this lack of sensation and muscular paralysis, sitting balance is pretty often insecure. Often riders need a wider base of support from the horse. And if you notice with this young lady, she is on a 16 hand Clydesdale. And you'll notice as we've talked about in other presentations, her leg actually come, doesn't come much below the length of the saddle flap. However, we've always taught this rider with a jumping position from the hips downwards. Because of the floppy tone and the damage she has, she's much more secure with her leg in a jumping position because it creates stability. A dressage leg, length leg, will tend to lengthen the, the, the thigh, yeah, but what it does is it opens the hip more, encourages the rider to flop forwards, and the seat will fly to the back of the saddle. So this is the one group of riders where you would teach them jumping position, and then you can see from the picture she's pretty stable. At Riders with Spina Biff, it's very, very mindful that sitting still on the horse for long periods can make the horse sore and create pressure sores. These riders often have loose hips due to low muscle tone and the hips are therefore very mobile. These riders will also tend to wiggle and wriggle rather than correctly use their legs. So there's always a fine balance of finding a horse that is a little bit hotter off the leg and reacts so the rider does not have to kick. The rider should be able to sit still and focus on their balance and position and allow the horse to react off the lightest of aids. Because of where the lesion is, we sometimes find that rides in the spina bifida can become incontinent. So they may be catheterized, in which case when we're helping them get on and off, we have to be mindful of the bag, because if we press on the bag and it rips, we get a leak everywhere. And incontinence is incredibly embarrassing for everyone concerned. We have to be mindful of the dignity of our riders. And the chances are the athlete, the adult athletes are more likely to have learned to control and manage their incontinence. We also have to mention hydrocephalus. It's often associated with spina bifida, and it's an accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, usually due to an obstruction of its circulation. Wrongly, it's called water on the brain, and those affected may have a shunt fitted, so care has to be taken with the fitting of riding hats. That's why we talk about this. Pressure buildup due to ill-fitting helmets causes headaches. Sometimes due to this obstruction, brain damage can also occur, leading to cognitive problems as well as physical problems. Next slide, please. Spinal cord injuries. Usually caused by a traumatic incident to the spinal cord. Very often a horse fall or car accident or a motorbike accident. But of course, that's not exclusive. This damage to the spinal cord creates a loss of movement, control, and loss of sensation, sometimes incontinence, sometimes if the brake is quite high, breathing difficulties may occur. The body starts to react and behave differently. Spasms will often occur, which apart from the, crane, the, apart from the pain and cramp, distract the rider and cause tightness during mounting. I have known somebody to actually, as they've got into the, sat in the stirrup, sat in the saddle, their leg has gone into so tight a spasm, they've kicked their helper halfway across the arena because the leg has spasm, spasmed so tightly. Spasms also occur during stressful periods of, of training and when fatigue creeps in. We have to bear in mind that these riders cannot feel below the injury site, so they are very likely to get sore pressure sores, and then we have the associated problems. 
I, I, I don't like to ride this type of rider without stirrups. But you can also find, as happened to a rider I was working with, the stirrup can rub against the boot. If the metal stirrup rubs against the boot, it can cause circulation problems. At the very least, these can cause soreness. And in the worst case scenario, they can, they can cause gangrene and loss of toes. Any pressure saw must be taken very, very seriously. When the rider has a very high break, the upper limbs, including the hands and fingers, and the trunk muscles are affected. As we go lower down the thoracic spine, paraplegia takes over from tetraplegia, and, and paraplegia tends to be an injury to the thoracic and lower spine. It affects the lower trunk muscles and the lower limbs. Very often, paraplegic riders have developed good sitting balance by the time they ride. These riders cannot often correct themselves if they lose their balance and flop forwards. Their advantage is they're very often pretty symmetric on a horse. But if they flop forwards, they will lose their balance and very often cannot sit upright again. So very often you'll find a paraplegic rider sitting behind the perpendicular. It's often the only way they can push back against their, the bar on the saddle and stabilize themselves. This is not ideal for the horse and we must make sure the horse is strong in the back and has protection so the horse doesn't get sore. There's often a great challenge with retraining a rider with a spinal injury. They will have had an idea, usually they've ridden before, and will have an idea of what riding used to feel like and what they were capable of, and they want to do it again. This definitely causes frustration. Riders have to be given time to retrain their bodies and re-educate themselves during the new feelings. There's no quick fix. We've talked in the past about thigh straps, ankle straps, bar saddles to stabilize the rider. These days, the, the, new, the newer stirrups that can be adjusted at the stirrup, at the bottom of the stirrup leather are much more advisable than up at the bar at the top of the saddle where they can pinch the rider. One of the interesting things for me is a rider with, with paraplegia, if you can train your horse so the horse is loose in the rib cage, as the rib cage of the horse expands, even though the rider cannot use their legs, as the, horse, as the horse's rib cage expands through breathing, the rib cage will feel the rider's leg against their side, and that can act as a forward aid. So once we start studying rhythmical movement and the riders following and moving in a rhythmical way, the riders very often can become correctly very reactive to the rider's legs even though the rider cannot control the use of their legs. Next slide please. Head injuries. Head, head injuries occur after a fall, a motorbike accident or an impact injury. They very often sadly leave residual brain damage which manifests itself in many many ways. There can be both physical and psychological outcomes to this. And healing can take a long time and often in something like PTSD leave changes in temperament, which means riders no longer filter and control their emotions. They very often say things they shouldn't or they say things at an inappropriate time. The filter is very often gone. With head injuries, the actual physical symptoms can include balance, loss, loss and poor coordination and disturb disturbing of the muscle tone. Psychologically, the, the symptoms are much more tricky to deal with. They, include, they can include loss of motivation or the opposite. They can create problems with obsession. They can create problems with concentration, irritability, frustration and aggressive behavior. And of course, a loss of self-control and self-esteem. And again, we must remember that not only is the rider learning to deal with their new body, but the parents or the partner and the support workers are also learning to, to, to understand how the new person is coming to terms with their disability. It's a 
difficult time for everyone and coaches must be patient. Riding, of course, though, can be a great therapy. It can work wonders as an invigorating environment and a new challenge. It can encourage fresh air, activity with like-minded people. It can take riders away from their own troubles. And sometimes involvement in group activities help redevelop social skills. Riding develops attention. Next slide, please. Next two challenges we, we talk about are muscular dystrophy, which comes in various forms, and they are all progressive at various rates. And the most common type of muscular dystrophy is Duchenne's, which is a genetic type of disability, mainly found, not exclusively, but mainly found in boys. Um, muscular dystrophy is a generalized weakness that starts at the hips, usually at around 10 or 11 years of age. And as it progresses, the trunk and the upper limbs also become affected. Eventually, the facial muscles, the heart and the lungs are also affected. And this con condition develops in children and shortens life expectancy. You immediately have that challenge then of getting kids who probably know what's going on in their lives. But they want to do the most they can while they can. But sadly, as the condition progresses, they will see their peer group of brothers and sisters doing more and more while they can do less. So that in itself causes coaching challenges. And by the time they're in their early teens, riders with muscular dystrophy are reliant on wheelchairs. But riding can assist with maintaining core movements. Frequent rest periods are advised and regular assessments must be carried out. Riding will keep the trunk muscles operational and help balance in response to the movement of the horse. Boys in particular, though, become frustrated. It will creep, it will creep into the sessions as, they, as skills they learned and become proficient in become more difficult to maintain. We also have multiple sclerosis. It's one of the more common occurring progressive neurological dis disorders that we're finding these days. And it often, not always, often starts in early adulthood. It has a pattern to its progression and it's usually a series of acute episodes followed by partial re remission, which after the remission leads back to gradually increasing disability. The pattern is different for everyone, of course, but in general, there is increased muscle tone, loss of coordination of movement, which in turn limits function. Gross motor skills, such as walking, starts to diminish. Speech, vision starts causing challenges. Skin sensation can be ab abnormal, and fatigue is a constant battle and should be avoided wherever possible. Utilizing the period of remission for learning and greater activity is very important. There can also be marked mood swings between depression and euphoria, and these must be dealt with very sensitively by the coach. Next slide, please. Stroke. A stroke, as most of us know, is caused by damage to different areas of the brain, and each stroke is different. And so even more than usual, it's vital that each rider is taken as an individual. The damage can cause a loss of movement and sensation to the area of the body it controls. Speech and swallowing is often affected. And there may be changes to personality and cognitive function. Cognitive function rela relates to the mental processes of perception, memory, judgment and reasoning, contrasted with emotional and volatile processes. Muscle weakness and a change in its tone can result in a hemiplegic type condition. Asymmetrical posture and loss of normal range of movement will produce problems with balance and function. And then we start to have sensory processing impairments, with conditions where the brain has difficulty with understanding the messages it's getting from external stimuli and the feedback of the central nervous system. <coughs> Excuse me. There can be challenges with sensitivity of the skin, causing spasm and soreness through oversensitivity. This in 
as well can cause coordination, balance and spatial awareness problems, as well as proprioception, which is the processing of many messages from joint nerves. This pro lack of proprioception and this sensory pro processing impairment, well, think of it like this. If you're listening to a radio and it's not tuned in properly, there's a lot of white noise. And that white noise, that, that movement and that sensory changes, the rider finds distracting and has challenges in, in deciphering. However, repetitive rhythmical movement helps to establish the base to create balance and improve the control over muscle skill, motor skills. Next slide, please. Rheum so we, we then, the third group of impairments are orthopedic conditions. Rheumatoid arthritis is a painful, degenerative and progressive condition. It may start off with affecting single joints or many joints, especially the hands and feet, wrists, toes and ankles. Acute pain flare-ups will occur and will weaken and debilitate the rider. They can certainly cause irritability and frustration. In children, there's a painful condition called still disease. It produces acute inflammation of the joints, deformity, and then muscle wastage as the joints can't work properly. Pain is always present. Other than rheumatoid arthritis, you have osteoarthritis. Very often the effect of a previous injury or wear and tear to weight bearing or overuse joints. With any orthopedic condition, pain is the limiting factor. Riding should be avoided during acute phases of pain, but if the rider insists on riding, the coach must be mindful to pain and long-term extra damage occurring. Cold, damp weather certainly does not help an athlete with these challenges. Next slide, please. And then we have the absence or deformity of individual limbs, and they can be caused before birth or as a result of accident or disease. The absence of limbs cause an asymmetry in the body, which is a, a different type of asymmetry to those who are neurologically impaired. It can also affect the center of gravity. In this case, with this rider, a prosthesis may be worn. Weight distribution may be unequal and care must be taken to ensure the saddle does not get distorted or the horse's back gets sore. Adapted equipment may be needed and care must be taken to ensure that symmetrical seat and core stability is maintained and improved. If the rider has learned to compensate, crookedness will feel normal and visual stimuli must be used to develop true straightness. When upper limbs are affected, care must be taken to ensure that a good contact with the bit and the horse's mouth is not compromised. The rider must be able to use the joint and muscle that they've got left effectively. You can see from this picture, this young lady has a lower arm prosthetic. This um, actually has a pincer in the fingers which actually grips the rein. However, at the same time, this rider has um, a completely uh, normal, unaffected elbow. You can see here that her use of the elbow maintains a safe contact with the, the horse's mouth. The real challenge, of course, is what happens if the horse pulls or the rider comes off. There has always got to be a breaking point where the arm can come away from the rider. I did have a situation once where a horse galloped off with a rider, the rider fell off and the arm stayed attached to the horse as it galloped round the showground. Not ideal, but at least the rider came off cleanly and, and safely. Riders who have lost limbs through accident or illness may be suffering from traumatic loss and emotional challenges may occur, especially during puberty. Where the, where the limb has been removed, the new skin and scar tissue will be susceptible to skin breakdown and phantom pain. The skin sensation will be damaged and compromised. The rider and their personal support staff must continually monitor the skin for abrasions. Any damage to the skin around the joint with a prosthetic limb will take time to heal 
due to poor circulation. Sweat and grime can cause more skin breakdown through rubbing. Also, limb loss realistically means that blood circulates faster around the body as there are less areas for the blood to go. This means that heat regulation can be compromised as the body may stay warmer for longer. Prosthetic limbs clearly do not change size. But the stump may shrink or swell in the heat. The limb can work loose, causing a risk of detachment or distraction. It can also cause rubbing. Phantom pain in scar tissue can, or missing limbs is frustrating and also distracting. Next slide, please. <coughs> this is just a different view of a prosthetic attached to the reins. Again, this hook grips with the pinter movement and in this rider's case is controlled by the movement of the shoulder so when this rider moves their shoulder forward the pincer opens when they bring their shoulder back the pincer closes that's really important for the symmetry of the rider and to remember what the, to what the shoulder is doing in some of the more advanced movements and then we also come down to some of the other micro uh, neurological disorders like autism and ADHD. These challenges are not recognised for international para sports, but you still may come across them in your dealings with riders with head injuries or in ordinary therapeutic riding. They are very often high functioning, but they have difficulties using and understanding non-verbal cues and therefore developing correct relationships with coaches. They will very often have special interests and be very focused in certain areas, but they have a difficulty in expressing themselves and in organizing themselves. They often appear to lack empathy with others and their surroundings. They have difficulty with sensory issues and strongly need a routine to give themselves security and a framework for reference. They like timekeeping. They like order because it fits into their world. And again, if we go back to the idea of a radio with white noise, none of us like that. It's so distracting. But if there's a lot of noise and riders can't process it properly, it can cause a lot of frustration. We have to remember that riders with autism, sometimes their behaviour is misinterpreted as willful malice. It's often more to do with the fact they've got no frame of reference. They don't know what our normal is. They become lost and confused. They don't know how to react in given circumstances. So they'll often regain their equilibrium by repetitive hand movements or swaying. This is disturbing for outsiders, but a necessary repetitive stimulus to recover their own security. Riders with this type of impairment learn by what is often called the Swiss cheese method. Certain things are learned in age appropriate ways while other skills are absent. So there are holes in their knowledge, whereas other parts of their knowledge are fully formed. Certain skills are way advanced of normal development ranges, but complex logical subjects like computer skills are easier to learn than say the complexities of communication. These riders will often melt down through fear, confusion, frustration. It's not bad behavior, but the coach needs to have a strategy of dealing with it rather than their own nerves taking over in the situation. Whenever a meltdown occurs, taking the rider away from danger to a quiet place, a safe space for cooling off and a routine plan for action is helpful for everyone. It's not a good idea to wade in and yell, calm down. I've never yet met a situation where somebody being told to calm down has done just that. And then afterwards, the coach should reflect and work out what triggered the behavior to ensure it doesn't happen again. Humans suffer from the same flight and fight mechanisms as other mammals. Outbursts, verbal outbursts are part of their protection mechanism. Athletes with autism are just exaggerated and unregulated. It's like an electrical circuit overload. So we have to remember that everybody learns in a different way. And just because one skill set has been learned, not other skills, they may not develop at the same time. 
Patience is needed with problem solving activities, breaking each step down into minute logical processes, just like maths. There's no time scale to this. So constant repetition is important and a tried and tested successful methodology is required. Positive and patient styles of coaching are needed. But when a client overly starts to repeat actions and words, it's a signal they're not coping. They need quiet to rebalance themselves mentally through secure and familiar answer, actions. Repeated actions and words on, on, from the client means stress levels are, are rising. The coach must recognize this and not react or provoke more stress. Raising your voice and reminding the athlete will only cause more stress to everyone. So I think techniques for coaching include preparing the rider by warning them of any change in activity, any change in schedule. Any new activities planned for the next week, prepare the support group who work with the athlete daily. Break everything down into simple, logical steps. Repeat instructions without too many irrelevant words. Keep phrases simple and where memory is a challenge and riders easy, cannot easily retain knowledge, time should be given for the rider to see if they can retrieve their own information. Coaches have got to remain calm, keep their volume calm and quiet as well. Loud noises, bright lights, strong tastes and textures, so even smelly environments can overstimulate a rider. These are all things that are so, so important. And then we come to riders with dyslexia. If you're not part of the 10 to 15% of the population who have this condition, it's difficult to understand how it affects people. <clears throat> it's easy to write it off as a challenge that can be overcome by simply working harder, learning to compensate. This is just simply not the case. Riders often just cover it up, which means they miss out on vital parts of their understanding. Many people go through years undiagnosed and just labeled stupid or not able to learn. Dyslexia can mean that people can see many different points of view which they can't always prioritize or make sense of a different viewpoints. It's just a mass of collected information that can cause forgetfulness and a belief that certain tasks have been completed. It's much more complicated than just having a difficulty in reading, writing or number work. So reading is a problem because the eyes see letters and the words moving around on the page. This is tiring to decipher. Details and concentrations for long periods become frustrating, making learning difficult due to processing and understanding. Thoughts and ideas can become disjointed because of the, because of the many, many messages that, are trying, that the brain is receiving. And dyslexia can also be inherited and in this way can, can help with a non-detection because the family just assumes it's the norm way of learning. So you can see from this, these added challenges why people often suffer from low esteem because they think and process differently. They can easily be made to feel stupid. <coughs> and that's it. Easy, really, isn't it? A little bit of information like that, and anybody can go and teach a rider with an impairment. But I think for me, we have Sue is on hand to answer any more technical questions, and these are my no only my notes. And although the medical terms have been checked for authenticity, I am not a medical professional. It's things like being mindful of language. It's paying attention and observing, and horses' welfare is the most paramount thing of important. And just remember, impairment and a lack of knowledge are very different things. Does anybody have any questions? So what we're going to do now, Clive, is we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. I'm just going to remind everyone to please utilize the buttons down at the bottom of the screen. I know some of you have already raised your hands, but if you would be so kind as to use the Q&A down at the bottom.
I know it's getting on quite late for Clive right now. It's past midnight. So for those of you who have questions, perhaps if you could um, pass them along via the Q&A. Thank you. I'm seeing questions now coming in. So I have a question from Susan. Please elaborate on the qualities and characteristics you look for in a horse that's suitable for a young and petite dressage athlete with hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll come on to horsepower um, at a, a later presentation. Um, but for me, a young person with, with hydrocephalus has to have, the horse has to have, every single horse I work with should, must have, yeah, I will use the word must, must have even gates. So the paces must be regular, rhythmical, balanced, and, and straight. That is, it's virtually non-negotiable for me. And even if the, if the trot is not particularly extravagant, that's perfect because the rider can learn to do sitting trots correctly. And in a later presentation, we'll look at why you teach sitting trots and not rising trots. I think, I th I think the, the horse for a young person with hydrocephalus must have a pretty wide base of support. Not so wide that you cause problems to a rider with loose, maybe floppy hips but it has to be wide enough to carry the base of support more than anything else. And of course, you know, like any horse, the horse should go in a reasonably correct frame. I hope that answers that question. Indeed, and I'm just seeing if we've got any others that have filtered their way through. So just give me a moment here, Clive. I'm finding the internet slightly slow this evening. So we thank everyone for their patience. Sue, do you want to add anything about the type of horse for somebody with hydrocephalus? Clive, I'm in full agreement with you. I agree that the wide base of support for the athlete is of paramount importance. And also um, the symmetry or the equal rhythm and gait that the horse has to be it's in itself symmetrical, not tight on yeah. one side and, and loose on the other. And this will help that rider to develop that uh, sense of uh, symmetry, equal balance um, themselves. So, you know, totally uh, uh, support what you've said. And, and I think it's very important to reckon, recognize um, that actually the horses actually need help themselves. The horses need to be regular maintained with their own physiotherapy and their own stretching and their own training by an able-bodied rider in order to, to make them as easy as possible for a young person to learn to ride them effectively. You wouldn't learn to drive a car if it only had three wheels and no steering wheel. And I think maintaining our horses properly and effectively is a very important part of developing our riders. I still have two individuals who have their hands up. I would kindly ask you if you don't mind to please use the question and answer function down at the bottom of the screen. If you are having difficulties with the question and answer function, I will give this a moment or two and I will unmute you to allow for the question. But if you could please utilize that function, then we'll have this properly recorded on the video, thank you. So I'll just see Clive if these individuals are able to um, make their way and I believe not. So what I'm going to do for this one individual is I will allow that person to speak. So I've got two that I'm unmuting presently. Oh, and here we go. So we have some feedback just from the audience thanking us very much for all this helpful information this evening. And they're looking forward to 
having more webinars in the future. Both individuals that I have unmuted, I'm not hearing any questions coming forward. So what I'd like to do is once again, Clive, thank you ever so much for joining us this evening, especially with the hour of the evening that it is tonight. And again, thank you, Sue, for joining us this evening. And of course, Jamie Ann. Jamie Ann, do you have a few final words this evening? Um, I would like to say uh, thank you for everybody for joining us this evening. Um, oh. As you know, uh, we were to do equine paces, um, but due to the timeline, um, and I know it's been kind of uh, getting late for everybody, um, we're gonna split uh, the session up and we'll do a second session um, and come in and do the equine paces on uh, a separate webinar. We apologize for that, but it was just, um, we, had, we didn't realize the amount of, um, content that we had to cover for the first portion. Um, but thank you. Clive, do you have anything to add to that? No, only that I am available via email. Um, or if anyone's got any questions they'd rather ask privately, you can find me on Facebook or, as I say, or email through, through Equestrian Canada. And if I haven't covered anything tonight or there's something else you're concerned about, I'm very happy to answer your questions privately um and pass them on to sue so that we can deal with your challenges in a sensitive professional manner for sure and definitely set you everybody can forward them to uh, myself jamie and goodfellow at uh questioning canada as a program coordinator i'm happy to make sure you get the answers that you're looking for and we did have one final and very important question that i should uh, make note of People have asked if this will be available online and absolutely it will be. For those of you who are looking for any of our webinars that we have done to date, you can go to YouTube and type in Equestrian Canada. And then underneath that, just go to the tab that states videos and you'll find a listing of all of our videos, those being para as well as dressage, there'll be the full list available there. So we'd like to once again, thank everyone for joining us tonight. We hope to see you in a few weeks time for the continuation of this webinar. I wish to thank you again on behalf of Clive and Jamie Ann for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Good night.